with this session, we have um, uh, Frederic Jenny, who is the uh, chairman of the OECD Competition Committee, and who's also a professor at ESSEC uh, business, law, uh, business School. I had the privilege of sharing a platform with him uh, quite many times, and before I matured into that uh, capability, I have learned from it, uh, him extensively in very many uh, conferences, uh, in very many of which uh, he um, was the, the lead uh, uh, person um, uh, taking a particular topic forward. Thank you very much, uh, Gananj, and, and thank you so much for having organized uh, this event. Uh, not only, uh, I did, somebody mentioned uh, earlier this morning when they first came to Istanbul, my first visit to Istanbul was in the summer of 1964, and uh, even though I've been coming to Istanbul uh, repeatedly, I never ceased to be marveled by the beauty of the of the city, but this event is also very interesting. I was much uh, interested by the, the talks this morning, so thank you so much for uh, this, and of course, uh, very happy anniversary uh, to the Elig Law Firm. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about convergence, uh, particularly in merger control. Um, talking about convergence in competition law is a little bit like talking about happiness. Uh, it's a usually interesting topic, but it's very hard to get down to precisely what we mean by convergence and to find a common understanding of what is uh, really happening. Uh, nevertheless, uh, I'm going to try my hand at it, and I'm going to start from, uh, by uh, reminding you that in, in a celebrated book, uh, which uh, uh, was uh, published uh, three, about three years ago, uh, David Gerber, uh, among others, uh, gave the following assessment uh, given the relative weakness of its impetus factors and the obstacles that convergence face, there's little basis for expecting extensive convergence to occur across wide ranges and dimensions of competition law and on a global uh, level. Now, I'm going to start from there and, in fact, use some of the work that we've done at OECD, looking at different dimensions of, uh, uh, of uh, convergence, to try to get a, maybe a more precise assessment of uh, what has happened uh, uh, recently uh, in the area of uh, uh, convergence. And I, I, would, I would just want to, start to state at the beginning that there are three ways in which I think that convergence is taking place. Uh, one of them is the hard convergence uh, in the sense that uh, uh, our trade uh, colleagues uh, uh, contribute hugely to uh, the convergence by uh, insisting that there should be competition dimensions in trade agreements, and this has been a, uh, a way in which there has been uh, increasing convergence throughout the world. There's a soft convergence, and soft convergence is you know, just uh, uh, the production of, of uh, standards and, and good practices, and of course the OECD, uh, with which I've been associated for uh, several decades now, as well as the ICN, have been extremely active uh, in this area. And I think that there is a third force that leads to convergence, which is just the passage of time, the fact that uh, all competition authorities learn from their mistakes and, and adapt, and, and this tends to, they tend to learn the same thing and uh, eventually to uh, come uh, closer together. Um, of course, when one talks about convergence, one has to somehow differentiate two types of convergence, the convergence among competition authorities in countries which have a well-established competition uh, uh, system, and also the fact that many new countries, uh, more than 60 countries in the last uh, uh, decade and a half, have acquired a competition law and uh, therefore have newcomers, but have uh, to a certain extent integrated some of the uh, wisdom of the uh, country which have had a longer experience. So we have to have to think about convergence both in terms of convergence among developed nations and between developed nations and newer nations uh, coming, to, uh, uh, coming to competition law. Some of the limits I want to mention right uh, from the beginning, uh, I don't believe that convergence 
of competition laws in general and merger laws in particular can be complete. Uh, I think that in the end, and this is certainly the experience that we uh, have seen in many developing countries, uh, in the end, uh, a law is a political act where there are trade-offs between uh, various uh, uh, objectives uh, and which is rooted in the reality, uh, the history, the political circumstances of the country, uh, which means that in many countries, and I'm going to come back to this uh, later on, uh, we see that we have competition laws that are not purely competition laws, but are competition laws that have different goals, uh, uh, and some of them are public interest goals, uh, uh, because this is the cost that one has to pay to have a competition law. Uh, okay. So that's the first limitation of convergence. There are, Competition laws are rooted in national realities. The second one is that I think that when one thinks about convergence, a lot of people think about conflicts and say, ah, convergence would be good, they would avoid conflicts. I would argue that it's, it doesn't necessarily entirely follow from convergence that conflicts are going to disappear. It depends on what one converges on. Uh, so convergence cannot guarantee that uh, uh, conflicts uh, between competition authority will disappear. But of course, the discussion about convergence is uh, uh, interesting because not only are there organizations that are devoted to promoting convergence, but also globalization means that they are both in the merger area and in the uh, antitrust area, many more areas, uh, many more uh, uh, transnational issues that used to be the case, and therefore the issue has been quite uh, important for the business community. So let me look at various dimensions, uh, and all this is based on different roundtables that we've had over time at OECD, as I said. Different dimension, f starting from competition law in general and then focusing on mergers, uh, merger control in particular. On the goals of competition law, uh, I think that it's fair to say that we still have four types of countries. Countries, I would say the dominant uh, uh, number of countries is probably countries that have as the goal of their competition law a consumer welfare uh, uh, standard, but there are quite a number of countries that still have a total welfare or do have a total welfare uh, uh, standards, which is something that the economists uh, uh, tend to think is uh, not necessarily a uh, bad idea. Uh, there is uh, a number of countries that also pursue other economic goals besides uh, uh, consumer welfare or total welfare, uh, such as the protection of small and medium-sized firms. Uh, and finally, there are countries that have also non-economic social political goals. Uh, the most well-known example of this type would be South Africa, for example, uh, which has a, a provision uh, to uh, try to promote the empowerment of the disenfranchised uh, black community. So there is not a unique goal of competition law across the world. That's the first thing. Now let me go to uh, definition of mergers, uh, since we're going to, I'm going to focus on mergers. There is no unique definition of what a merger transaction is for the purpose of merger control uh, throughout the world. Um, first of all, there are different ways to, uh, or different criteria which are applied to a transaction to know whether it is a merger or not. We have countries that have an objective criteria, such as a share of the uh, uh, capital, for example, of the 50% uh, of the shares of, uh, uh, of the target, uh, but we also have countries that have an economic criteria to define what is a merger uh, and in the economic criteria there are a number of different uh, or subcategories uh, which are uh, used um, um, such as uh, the acquisition of a decisive influence or the acquisition of a significant influence or the acquisition of a material influence or the acquisition of a competitively significant uh, uh, influence all those are uh, a little bit uh, similar, but one thing to remember is that uh, to the extent that there is convergence towards the economic criteria, this leads to a little bit more uncertainty uh, than uh, if, there were, if there is convergence on the objective criteria, because the objective criteria is easy to master, whereas the notion of influence, whether it's significant material or otherwise, it's a little bit uh, more uh, difficult. So this is an era where the economic uh, uh, approach leads to a certain legal uh, uh, uncertainty. 
Finally, I should mention that some countries uh, mix the two types of uh, criteria uh, uh, and uh, usually as alternatives. Um, okay, the second thing is that there's not other a definition of what kind of transactions are uh, uh, mergers. Uh, there are, I mean, some of them are uh, very clear, but when, when it comes to a number of uh, smaller or more difficult transactions, such as the acquisition of an asset. Okay, when is the acquisition of a boat, the acquisition, or, or ship in that case, uh, to take a European case recently, when is the acquisition of a trademark uh, or a patent, uh, is this a merger or not? Uh, uh, there are uh, different uh, point of view in different countries. Uh, some countries insist that the assets should be part of an undertaking. Other countries uh, have a looser definition and accept that any asset which may play a role in uh, trading activity may uh, the acquisition of such an asset may be considered to be a, uh, a, a merger. Um, the second uh, dimension of this that uh, I want to uh, mention is the acquisition of minority interest. Again, there is a certain variety across the world. Uh, in some countries, uh, it's a minimum percentage of the uh, shares of the capital of, uh, of the target, which is the, uh, considered to be a merger for the purpose of merger control. In other countries, there is a, a looser standard or more economic standard. Uh, it's whether or not the acquirer uh, can exercise a competitively significant influence, for example, which determines whether or not this is a merger for the purpose of merger control. Uh, okay. So the acquisition of uh, minority shareholdings is not treated the same way in uh, both uh, types uh, of country. I should add that when it comes to joint venture, there are also differences both in the concept of which joint ventures should be considered to be uh, uh, mergers, but also how they should be treated. Some countries have specific provisions for joint ventures. Other countries don't feel the need for uh, specific provisions and treat joint ventures as uh, general uh, mergers. Now, if I move to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the next uh, uh, topic, uh, the definition, uh, the, uh, sorry, the, uh, the um, notification criteria, uh, again, there is a certain amount of uh, uh, differences, but there, much more than for the definition of merger, there has been a tendency towards convergence uh, in recent year. Uh, this tendency has been to try to strengthen the local nexus to make sure that competition authorities were only looking at transactions that could have, in fact, uh, a possible effect on competition. Uh, and uh, this is certainly one of the areas where the ICN in particular has been very active uh, to try to uh, make sure that uh, the thresholds uh, should be uh, uh, re should reflect the possible influence of the merger in the country. There's been a movement for uh, from subjective threshold in market shares, uh, which still exists in very few countries, uh, uh, towards objective thresholds. Uh, and uh, there are good examples, I think, that uh, in my side, yes, uh, uh, the Brazilian legislation, for example, is a case where Brazil has moved toward the uh, general consensus, uh, but we also have had movement in, in a number of other countries, such as Spain, Portugal, uh, Israel, uh, etc. So there, there's been quite a bit of consensus uh, and also a convergence that goes towards a more objective definition of the thresholds and more easily readable. So there is consistency between the convergence and uh, I would say a tendency toward more uh, legal uh, uh, security. Now, if I move to the substance of the analysis of uh, whether a merger uh, which is notifiable, may or may not uh, uh, lead to a competition problem. Uh, it is quite uh, significant that there has been a huge move since the beginning of the century uh, towards uh, uh, the substantial lessening of competition standard with a lot of countries, European countries in particular, uh, either abandoning the dominance test or reducing the importance of the dominance test by adding the possibility of a substantial lessening of competition uh, standard. 
the reasons for this movement are, I think, at uh, different levels. Uh, uh, first of all, a uh, number of competition authorities were concerned about the fact that the courts might give a narrow interpretation of uh, what uh, dominance was. Second, there was a certain amount of uncertainty about what the boundaries of, of the concept of dominance uh, could be, uh, right, uh, collective dominance, for example. Uh, and third, there were difficulties, of course, to treat some mergers that did not lead to um, dominance, but clearly led to a decrease uh, uh, in the competition. So overall, there's been a, a clear movement has it made much difference? Uh, we looked at this at OECD. We only could find a couple of cases. There was a celebrated case in Australia that was caught at the time when the legislation changed, and which was it was a merger between two retail uh, outlets, and uh, uh, it uh, it was a merger that was considered to be anti-competitive until under one standard, but was uh, not uh, considered to be uh, anti-competitive or controllable under the other standard. Uh, but those have been reasonably marginal uh, uh, changes because besides the changes in legislation, in fact, competition authority had for quite a while before that been applying something which is close to a substantial lessening of competition uh, standard. But fair amount of, of convergence there. Um, now, the this, of course, leads to uh, uh, better cooperation or more uh, possibility of cooperation between uh, uh, authorities when they review uh, mergers. Um, but uh, there are limits, uh, four possible limits to this convergence on the, uh, on the substance that uh, are probably uh, worth pointing out. Um, first of all, the it's interesting that the lessening uh, of competition standard is an economic standard which is not so easy to deal with. And in a sense, there's conversions towards a standard which kind of increase the legal uncertainty or the, the unpredictability of the decisions of competition authorities. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is that competition authorities may, under these standards, think about quite different, uh, uh, quite different theories of harm uh, second, there's the fact that uh, the economics of vertical mergers is not very uh, clear in economic theory. There's no real consensus on how to approach those vertical mergers. And third, of course, there is the possibility that uh, the, uh, there are also uh, uh, public interest uh, goals uh, which are uh, going to come into conflict, so to speak, uh, with uh, the standard. I will come back uh, to this. Okay, so let me now move to uh, merger remedies. So we've seen so far that the definition of merger, not much convergence, the definition, uh, the notification of merger, still differences, tendency to, towards convergence when it comes to the standard, but the implementation of the new standard uh, may lead to uh, differences of appreciation. Uh, merger remedies. Uh, merger remedies is, uh, of course, also a topic of uh, huge interest. Um, it's, it's an interesting topic because when we looked at merger remedies at OECD, we saw that things are not what they seem to be. If you ask the competition authority of a developed country that has had competition law for a long time uh, what it thinks about structural remedy versus behavioral remedies, the answer is nearly automatic. Oh, structural remedies are much better because they involve less monitoring costs on the part of the competition authorities. Then when you go to the merger case law and you look at what they actually do, you see that in many cases there is a majority of cases where they're used in fact other uh, behavioral remedies or at least a combination between structural and behavioral remedies. So the reality seems to be quite a bit different from what is being announced. Then when you move to developing countries, uh, you get the opposite view. Uh, the opposite view is first I will look at behavioral uh, remedies and if I cannot find one, maybe I will consider the possibility of uh, structural uh, remedies. Now why is it that uh, in developing countries uh, there is a more uh, favorable treatment of uh, behavioral remedies uh, for a number of reasons. In some of the mergers, there's no local assets to, to be uh, disposed of. 
or if there are local assets to be disposed of, there's no one to buy them. I mean, it's very difficult because uh, we have uh, uh, very narrow financial markets or very few competitors to find uh, uh, somebody to buy those assets. And third, uh, uh, because uh, the, the a number of developing countries, for the reasons which I mentioned, have public interest clauses uh, that lead to uh, specific uh, uh, remedies. Now, this being said, um, this is uh, interesting because uh, this is taken from a submission from South Africa uh, to the, uh, an OECD debate we had on remedies. And what it says, in, in instances where behavioral conditions are sufficient to address the concern, the Commission will not uh, insist on a structural remedy. So it's the inverse uh, uh, approach from the one that you would find in most developed countries where you would uh, uh, literally say in instances where structural remedies uh, uh, are uh, possible, we will not uh, look at behavioral uh, remedies. Okay, so let me, this is uh, uh, mostly what I wanted to say, and let me uh, say that there's much more, the issue of cooperation on merger remedies has become much more important uh, than it used to be, uh, of course, uh, because of the globalization of uh, transnational uh, merger, I mean, of, uh, yeah, transnational mergers. Now, what conclusions uh, can one draw from uh, those, this quick look at various dimensions of uh, convergence uh, in merger? The first one, I think, is that uh, it's quite clear that uh, uh, merger, uh, that uh, uh, sorry, that the convergence is taking place. Uh, but of course, the base sh shifts because there are more and more countries that adopt the competition law, which makes the pictures, uh, the picture, a little bit uh, uh, complex. Uh, the second is that uh, uh, merger control laws will depend to a large extent on the local specificities uh, of the countries and in particular in developing countries in many cases, but not only in developing countries, in many cases on the existence of public interest clauses, which is probably at this point the most important hurdle on the way towards convergence, uh, assuming uh, towards more convergence. I want just to say one thing about this. Uh, there has been a debate, particularly with respect to China, but sometimes with respect to South Africa, about whether young competition authorities are in fact uh, using competition in a strategic way to pursue, I don't know, industrial policy objectives or things like this. When you look, particularly in the case of China and South Africa, when you look at the cases that they actually deal with, uh, first of all, one can always argue or not, uh, not be convinced by a case, but that uh, happens everywhere. But one finds that mostly uh, the things which are considered to be uh, not the proper behavior on the, on the part of the Chinese MOFCOM are due to the fact that there are specific provisions in the Chinese, in the Chinese competition law that you do not find in other competition law, that merger control has to uh, promote the uh, development of a socialist economy, or that you find in the uh, foreign investment law that uh, uh, the takeover by foreigners of uh, well-known brands should be uh, given particular attention because there is a desire to protect the well-known Chinese brands. And that explains a lot, I mean, if you think about the Coca-Cola case, for example, in China, or if you think about many uh, other cases, the explanation is quite clear. The origin of this is not the fact that MOFCOM is behaving strategically, it is that it is implementing a law which has public interest clauses. The same goes for, let's say, South Africa, uh, the Walmart case, to, ca to take one of the uh, several cases uh, which has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, behavioral remedies were imposed by uh, the Commission. In South Africa, if a merger doesn't create a competition problem, but if it does not contribute to the public interest, well, the competition authority can intervene, even though there's no competition issue, which was pretty much the Walmart uh, case. Uh, so the uh, behavioral remedies, which are very far off from what uh, uh, you would find in a developed country uh, um, uh, on Walmart, are not so surprising if one of the goals of competition law is to promote the uh, disenfranchisement of, uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, the promotion of the disenfranchised population. So, of course, that leads to another discussion, which is whether there should be public uh, interest uh, uh, provision in competition law. And there you have, I mean, it's very hard to, to, to have a definite view on this because it depends, again, from the, on the local conditions. But uh, certainly in South Africa, if there was not this particular public interest provision in the law, there probably would not have been a competition law in the first place. 
Uh, so are we better off? Uh, a lot of people argue that those public interest provisions should be taken care of by other regulators. Uh, I'm always a bit uh, worried about this because who knows what those other regulators would do. Uh, so maybe the competition authorities are more sensible uh, in the way they do it. And certainly the competition authorities of South Africa have been more sensible in the way they've applied those uh, uh, provision than uh, someone else uh, would have been. Finally, to the extent that the convergence is towards more economic analysis, and we've seen that there are several areas, for example, the substantive standards, that does not reduce the, uh, the difficulty to predict what competition authorities are going to do, or it does not eliminate the possibility that uh, they will enter into conflict. We had such a conflict in Europe uh, not very long ago between the uh, UK and France on the uh, seafaring uh, uh, case where the acquisition of boats was considered to be an anti-competitive uh, merger in one case and uh, uh, something which was uh, acceptable uh, without uh, much, uh, I mean, with some uh, commitment, but uh, not a lot of commitment uh, in, in another case. So, convergence is probably not uh, in itself entirely achievable. Convergence has happened. Conversion doesn't solve all the problem. And if we really want to promote more convergence, we should not so much talk to the competition authorities, but talk to the governments that put public interest clauses in competition laws. Thank you very much. Thank you for this, this speech. Um, uh, it, it's a hotly debated topic also in Turkey. Um, we had uh, debated this also in, in my book in 2001 on, on the prime objective of competition law. Um, from a law and economics perspective, we were debating if uh, the protection of um, certain sizes of businesses should be uh, a goal. We were debating uh, very many other issues. Um, and uh, in Turkey, we've seen the Turkish Competition Authority really do a brilliant job, I must say, with always keeping to the code and making sure that the prime objective of competition law is some form of welfare maximization. I was taking the view in the book, and I still am of the same opinion, that it should be total welfare maximization. But so long as any, anybody is speaking the welfare maximization language, that's fine in my book. Uh, the minute we start talking about other goals that are imported into competition law, that's when you start getting uh, into the thin ice territory, especially in emerging markets, especially back in those years with the Turkish Competition Authority. And uh, I think it's a, it's a brilliant uh, uh, thing. It's a wonderful uh, situation that uh, the Turkish Competition Authority has always had a keen eye on how to exclude um, defenses that are re relying on uh, goals or purposes that have nothing to do with competition law. And uh, it was very keen, and it still is very keen, uh, in marking them as outside the territory of uh, competition law enforcement. One particular risk factor that we're looking uh, at right now is, as time goes by, as Frédéric Geni says, the Turkish Competition Authority might prefer to take some of these topics under its hat, and there is a good and evil in that. Um, state aid is a particular candidate for that. My views on this is, is well known, that I would hate to see the Turkish Competition Authority take on state aid duties. And the reason is not that I think they wouldn't do a good job with it, but I think they've done a very honorable job of keeping themselves independent from uh, a political influence and in a country where political influence is everywhere and about everything, even about whether women should get abortion or uh, how many children we should be having. So there is a very deep uh, 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 pol political will about everything. And the more the Turkish Competition Authority would take on certain topics that are uh, in and of themselves so intertwined with uh, political agenda that it would be impossible for the Turkish Competition Authority to exclude lobbying activities, the more we're going to see um, competition law agenda also uh, uh, revolving, orbiting around uh, these kinds of topics is what I fear. But then again, if someone were to say, uh, well, if we, we were to do a, an independent job of uh, competition law enforcement, uh, 
in Turkey, but the state aid uh, enforcement would be really uh, suboptimal. How's that going to affect the competition law realm? Then I, I am silenced. I then start arguing in my mind, maybe it's not that bad a thing that the Turkish Competition Authority is taking on the state aid agenda. So these are the particular catch-22s of uh, competition agencies in jurisdictions where the cards are still uh, being dealt. 